All right, we're uh, we're talking to Robert Singleton of uh, Bird Electric Scooters, uh, the Scooter Share Program. Uh, am am I saying that right? Is it Bird Electric Scooters? Uh, just you can say Bird, um, or just call it the Shared Mobility Program. But yeah, all of the above works. All right, and uh, you know, uh, we kind of fly by the seat of our pants here on Bike Life Radio, and so uh, you're a pretty Im- and and so. Some of the questions might seem silly, and I apologize in advance for that. But you're a pretty important dude at Bird, aren't you? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Um, what? Uh, Why not? <laughs> uh, so I am the uh, government partnerships manager for Bird, covering um, uh, a lot of the West Coast, so um, the Rockies region, West Coast, and then all the way out to Honolulu. So um, I do from Honolulu to San Francisco, all the way to Reno, and then Denver. So basically, the straight line of states and and cities in that area awesome and and so recently uh you know i I guess it was a little more than a year ago uh we made an introduction asked bird to come to town and and uh then city councilman uh devin reese rode a scooter and then he was uh you know in your corner the entire time uh uh, getting pushing to get bird in in reno and now you've been here for a couple of months and and just recently hit a hundred thousand rides uh, 160,000 miles or something like that. Um, the the 1.5 miles is pretty standard, right? For mo- most communities, is that is that correct or is it longer? Yeah, 1.4, 1.5 miles. So actually, Reno is just a little bit higher than that. And then uh, to your other points, we've now facilitated um, as of today 130,000 unique rides and over 200,000 miles in total trip distance. Wow! Holy cow! So the the distance is increasing. Um, yeah, it's uh, as people get more familiar with the program, we do start to see um, people begin to rely on it more for for rather than the short little trips for recreation, but actual you know to to use it as a meaningful transportation option. Yeah. So at first they're like, "Whoa, not sure how to use this thing," and they uh, and they after they figure it out, then they start to use it for longer distances and 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 know where to go. So they might start in a place and then realize that they've hit the the kind of the the edge of of where they can go right Mm -hmm. or you know where uh the preferred parking locations are Uh uh-huh how is so how would you say that reno is different than other communities or are we exactly the same in terms of operation no i would say reno um is doing much better than most of the communities and and this is really um more about Reno just uh, having a, a lot of demand for this sh- for shared mobility. You know, we see a ton of ridership, like some of the highest rides per day per vehicle of any market um, in, in Bird globally, but especially in North America. Um, we also see, uh, I would say, some of the tightest and most compliant operations um, in res- in regards to our local fleet managers. So I would say Reno has some of the best, most invested local fleet managers here who are very prompt to respond to issues and complaints um, and have just been able to run uh, a really smooth smooth set of operations. Um, it's not to say that other cities don't, but I just say that the, the fleet managers we have in Reno are really top tier in terms of like their performance. And you know they, they are having a great time as, from, as far as I can tell. Um, doing this kind of work so excellent yeah i've seen them uh driving around town in u-haul trucks to pick up scooters and stuff which is is interesting uh how how does that work um so we work primarily with uh either existing companies um or people who are looking to get into business um and these are people who have access to either commercial storage or or vehicles or who are are done longer term commercial leases and things like that um, but they're the ones who are uh, principally in charge of charging, uh, maintaining, uh, deploying, and rebalancing our vehicles. Hmm. <clears throat> One of the interesting things that that kind of happened, uh, you know, when we made that introduction uh, a year and a half ago or whatever it was, and then uh, uh, a lot happened behind the scenes. And, and you know, we had no clue what was going on at the Trucking Meadows Bike Alliance, but, uh, but things were happening. And uh, so, you know, what... Uh, can you describe that kind of role of what happens behind the scenes and and why it's important to, um, I don't know, uh, work closely with with city and and you know local governments? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it comes down to like even just my, my title, for instance, government partnerships. You know, we really want to to uh, work with the, our communities that, you know, that we serve to design a program that's going to meet their needs um, and be proactive in how we think uh, how we think we're going to be, you know, if we're going to have to proactively address some kinds of, of issues or problems. Um, this is doing the, the outreach, the education, the working with the interest groups. Um, so not just, you know, the, the Bicycle Alliance, but also, you know, doing the proactive presentation to, um, you know, for instance, the seniors, the seniors committee, um, uh, as an example, um, you know, working with accessibility groups too, yeah. accessibility groups as well. Yes. Um, so, uh, and that, you know, all of that kind of direction, um, as well as, you know, the working with the, the city in particular to design, like, where should we have the, the parking for the vehicles, um, that all takes, um, a lot of back and forth, but, um, you know, ultimately it's, it, that's how we build some of the, the stronger relationships. And that's ultimately, you know, the, the same core, like thought leadership group that is, that is now weighing different elements of the program for the future. So. Yeah. One of the things that we've done when we're trying to educate the community, that education element is, is nuts, you know, like it's so important and, and there's so much to do associated with it. For instance, with that downtown pilot project that we have going on in Reno, it's more about, it's not about whether the system works. It's about whether we can educate the public on how it works. And so it's more like a pilot program to educate the public. And one of the things that we consistently run into is that people in cars see somebody not following the rules and they uh, get upset about that. And we have to explain that, you know, for every one person that they see, there's probably five to 10 to a hundred that are following the rules. Uh, and that often drivers don't follow rules. Like I saw a driver running a red light right after I saw a scooter run a red light, uh, you know, and, and so what, you know, I'm flying by the seat of my pants as usual, trying to uh, explain these things to people. Do you have standard responses that you use in communities across the United States? or around the world? Well, I, I think it all comes down to, I think a set of shared values. Um, so if we're, if we're truly committed to getting people out of their cars, we have to provide some kind of alternative. Um, and it's gotta be, you know, both cost effective, but also, um, you know, it's gotta make people feel safe. And so these investments and the infrastructure in particular separated bike lanes or having, you know, the, the designated spaces where people, um, are are given the 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 space to feel safe um is what's ultimately gonna um drive drive mode shift and drive better overall habits um in terms of following the rules um you know when people are, are worried about um yeah people on bikes and scooters not not necessarily following the rules i would say that it's the same it's for all modes it's just some are more visible than others or some that we've been more we've been more um condition to kind of like accept. Um, so people miss park cars every day. Significantly, uh, I would say, you know, a lot more cars get misparked every day in the same service area because there's a lot more cars and a lot more people. Um, so I'm not necessarily saying that there's the same level of, of rule breaking. I would be interested to seeing some, some study around that. Um, we always try and encourage our, our riders through the education and app and through, um, through email and through kind of doing the direct community events and hopefully by coming on programs such as this to let people know the do's and don'ts of the road, uh, stay off those sidewalks, we're telling you, please. Um, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's still like an ongoing effort, right? So um, I guess it's a roundabout way of saying that, uh, you know, it's still coming back to the fact that we wanna see the greater adoption of these vehicles, we wanna see the mode shift and we wanna to respond to climate change in a way that is, not going to to hurt people's quality of lives but providing them alternatives that still allow them to realize the benefits of having fast and easy and accessible transportation yeah amazing um one of the other things that's really important I, and i don't know if uh, what your experience is across the united states with this but do you find that that uh bicycle advocates are uh asking scooter share companies bike share companies to come into town and and working closely with them because if we're all, you know, in the boat of wanting to get more options for people besides cars, um, then it, it makes logical sense to me. But do you think that that, that that 
message is clear to everybody else across the nation or do we need more work? There? So I would say, um, well, I think we need, you know, more partnerships and more allies, I think is always going to be helpful. Um, I would say the vast majority of, of bike and pedestrian advocacy organizations um, are in favor of, of shared mobility and they do not see like scooters versus bikes. That's not the conversation that we need to be having. Um, I think the conversation we need to be having is, is meaningful transportation access beyond the car. So the car really is what we're competing against. And so, you know, I've seen cities, um, you know, I'll say one city in particular, um, Santa Cruz, where I had a conversation with um, a staffer who was worried about bringing scooters in the community because they were worried that I would compete with the bike share um, system that they're hoping to launch. And I, I was kind of at a loss to say like, you know, like, why are you worried about having yet more options for more people to get out of their cars? It shouldn't be uh, the bike competing against the scooter program. It should be, what program are you hoping to design that has a mix of options that's gonna better, better incentivize people to, to make that mode shift decision? So, um, you know, I think it's still uh, kind of a, a hurdle in terms of perception because, you know, uh, and I would think that, you know, like a, a lot of local government folks are, are a little bit trepidatious about trying new things. And so scooters are still perceived to be kind of new, even though that we've now had five years of operating in 400 plus cities and we have pretty well-defined best practices. You know, we've had new technology every single year. We've had more accurate geofences. We've had better onboard sensors. We've been able to develop parts that are both more resilient and cheaper to maintain. And so every single year we're making these major leaps and operationally in the, the back end system. So not only our bird AI, but the entire system for, for making recommendations to fleet managers about where they should be deploying to get the most rides possible or uh, making sure that we have a checklist that's an actual checklist for here's what you have to do before you release a bird into the wild in terms of you know getting it out back on the street. All that stuff, um, we've made leaps and bounds. And so I think just addressing that awareness gap head on and say, you know, really what we're all trying to compete against is the automotive centric means of planning that has dominated American cities for the past 60 plus years. And so, um, you know, it's time for the new infrastructure. It's time for the reinvestment and the reimagining of, of how we get around. Excellent. Um, yeah, you know, that, that competition element, somebody recently pointed out that uh, by putting some scooters out there that uh, you're potentially reducing traffic for drivers. So that would be a reason why drivers might also support uh, seeing more and more scooters on the road or, or bike or share programs. One of the things I, I don't know if you've got any insight in this. Let me let me remind everybody that we're listening to Bike Life Radio and we're talking to Robert Singleton of Bird, uh, the electric scooter share company. I, I was in Sacramento recently and I was riding on a, on a path that dead ended somewhere like at a freeway. It was nuts. And I ended up on the freeway. It really totally sucked. I was on a bicycle uh, and uh, there were a ton of homeless camps all along the river uh, that, 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 that I saw. And uh, among them were many, many bicycle share bikes. And I don't remember what the company was that I saw, but they, uh, many had their front wheel removed the one with the motor in it, uh, or their rear wheel removed. And then I saw wheels with the motor cut out of them. So the, the motors were being stolen to, uh, to recycle. And, uh, what have you seen any problems with like i guess technically with the scooters or, or challenges uh, to that extent or just in general in in the, the share um, um i mean we we do see you know bad actors every every so often um and you know there are acts of vandalism or people who are uh you know trying to get at certain parts um you know fortunately for us the way we've designed our modern our modern scooters and especially the bird threes which are our latest and greatest that are in Reno um, is that a lot of the the parts that people would want to steal are either one of a kind or, or really built into the the chassis of the vehicle. So you can't like steal the battery out of it and reuse that battery for something else unless you're like really technically proficient and and largely like an engineer. So it doesn't actually and plus it's it's really hard to get open the chassis unless you have the specialized tools that our fleet managers do have. So the amount of like return on investment for the effort to steal uh, or vandalize the scooter is really not much. 
Um, especially even people will go through and try and steal like the SIM cards, but the SIM cards don't work on anything other than the scooter. So if you do that once and realize it's not going to get you anything, there's almost no point in doing it another time. So while we do see isolated cases, um, you know, we've, this is part of our lessons learned, right? Being a company for about five years um, is we've learned how to design, um, you know, anti-theft into the, the chassis, the vehicle, so that it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense to want to steal these vehicles. Um, I think you see some of the older, the older vehicles and from, especially from either bike share operators or other operators where they, they're taking off the shelf vehicles from other companies and not designing their own. Um, you probably see that a lot more. Huh. huh. What would you say um, that is our biggest challenge in terms of infrastructure uh, and, and maybe some easy, uh, easy wins if there are any out there? Um, I'd say uh, anything we can do to create more, more spaces, either in the private or public right of way, um, where people can grow to depend on, on using these vehicles. So it's really about achieving ubiquity, right? Is if I'm someone who is trying to become like a, a one car household um, or, or no car household, you know, what are the options that I'm going to be utilizing to get around the city? And can I depend on them? Is Can I depend on there to be a scooter within walking distance of me any time if I'm in the service area in downtown Reno? And I would say right now, the answer is pretty much yes. And we've done a good job. Um, and I would say that, you know, as we begin looking at other parts of the city, at, you know, whether it's potential expansion or going into neighboring communities, um, it's, it's all about getting to that level of ubiquity. Um, yes, there are going to be every once in a while, there are going to be some scooters that people uh, misuse or, or leave blocking places they shouldn't. And it's up to us to respond to those in a timely manner and, and make sure that we're not allowing those isolated cases to detract from the larger benefits of 200,000 miles of carbon free transportation that we've been able to create. Yeah, and, and just a couple. Months. Yeah, and just a couple of months. It's amazing. Um, uh, again, this is Bike Life Radio, and we're talking to Robert Singleton of Bird. I know that you got to go here pretty soon, and so. Uh, but one of the things that we often like to do on Bike Life Radio is is talk to people about uh, their experiences on bikes, or in your case, it might be with a scooter or something like that—a personal experience, some some story that you like to to tell people. Do you have one uh, on a on a bike in particular? On a bike, um, so I mean. I'll tell you the reason why I, I joined the bird team. Um, so previously I was the executive director of the Santa Cruz County business council, which is a countywide uh, business association group. Um, we represent kind of the largest employers and I would be um, constantly driving around Santa Cruz um, to take these meetings and go meet with business owners. And um, when we first got bike share in our community, it, it fundamentally changed the way in which I got around um, and was what inspired me to want to participate in shared mobility programs because now I could get around the city um, uh, in a bike. So, you know, without having to take a car and, and, and burn carbon, um, I could do it with the electric assist. I wouldn't have to be sweaty. I could still wear my formal clothes and I can get up some of those, you know, particularly treacherous hills that we have in Santa Cruz in some areas. Um, make use of all the infrastructure that we as a community had invested in um, and ultimately have like a lot more fun doing it. Um, so like in Santa Cruz, uh, I don't know if you know, but in summertime when people are all coming from, you know, we are the Bay Area's beach, right? So we have got traffic coming from the entire San Francisco Bay Area coming down to warm, happy Santa Cruz, you know, having fun at the beach boardwalk, um, you know, going and enjoying our wonderful beer options. You know, I love living here. Uh, but it's a parking lot in terms of especially those weekend days where you just have tons of cars, the traffic backed up all the way through the center of the city and all the way up into the highway. So to be able to get around, um, especially from a local's perspective, to make use of these back roads, the, 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 our river levee, um, the isolated green lanes that we have on Broadway. And, you know, now I can do it in record pace. I can have I know there's always going to be a bike near me, um, so I don't have to worry about bringing my own and getting it stolen or something like that, which you know can definitely be a deterrence for one to bring your own personal vehicle out. Um, so having that level of ubiquity is what inspired me to want to be part of the bird team. And so I think scooters do all that and more and are faster, quicker, better, cheaper, and more approachable. And so I think they, these really are like the next step in, in urban mobility. 
All right. Do you have a message for uh, Carson City, Sparks, anywhere else? Um, you know, I I think as more and more people become familiar with with these systems and, and grow accustomed to using these vehicles, they're going to expect them more. And so if you're trying to get more tourists or if you're having local businesses who want to depend on having that increased traffic coming to and from their area, whether it's your scenic downtown or whether it's, you know, by the side of a lake where you know there's going to be a bunch of people who are going to be coming coming and going the whole time. Let's get people out of their cars. Let's get a smile on their face and let's, you know, help support local business. Yeah, that's one of the things that I, I imagine that uh, I, I think that every time I've ever ridden, uh, like in Portland, for instance, or in San Francisco on any kind of scooter or bike share, uh, it, it was just like a relief to not have to look for parking. Like that was, I, there was nothing more stressful than being in traffic, it would twist, you know, my head on a swivel looking for for a parking spot uh, while my kids were in the car freaking out. Instead, we all just had a great time. And, uh, you know, they followed me like ducks and like they usually do on a bike. And um, it, uh, it really does change your life. It's pretty amazing. Well, uh, Robert Singleton of Bird, I, I really appreciate you joining us on Bike Life Radio. And uh, we'll look forward to, to more conversations in the future as uh, what will reach like a million miles ridden in Reno alone, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the goal. Um, why stop at a million? Um, you know, our, our program is... is <laughs> is in place for the next three years so i think we can do well over a million miles um since, okay since we brought that up how many miles total has bird uh like throughout the entire world uh, had do you think uh well so we hit the 100 million mile uh mark in february for globally wow in february yeah so we're probably significantly over that by now um i don't have the exact number off the top of my head but um we, I can tell you that is um, we're breaking ridership records every single weekend right now. Um, you know, this is the first summer that people are able to come out of their house uh, minus COVID restrictions and feel really good about it. So people are traveling, uh, making use, uh, making use of these programs. And so we're just seeing, and the weather has been great so far this summer. Um, so we just, we're breaking records every weekend for the number of people who are deciding to use this type of transportation versus an automobile bird changing the world really fast <laughs> one community not fast enough <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks for joining us i won't hold you here with more silly questions uh but uh, thank you again for joining us and we'll talk to you again soon all right thanks kai appreciate all right. it i'd seen robert